for me, it's like the, the playing of the gig and making of the music is really the fun part. I often tell people, yeah, you're paying me for all the other stuff for organizing and setting up and bringing in blah, 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 and writing charts and all this stuff. But once I get there, the music is free, you know, and, and, and I want it to be, I want to feel happy at that point. So whatever I have going on on the outside, you know, I really, really try to shut it off and just go, this is my time right now. And these people have paid us for this and we're going to have a good time and we want them to have a great time. Mm -hmm. And so I think that is hugely important. This episode contains adult language and adult humor. Since when have trumpet players ever been considered adults? If you are easily offended by these types of conversations, consider switching to the oboe. Welcome to the Trumpet Gurus Hang Podcast. I'm your host, Jose Johnson. My guest for this episode is Bobby Medina. Bobby, well, he's been around the block. Originally from Los Angeles, Bobby toured the world playing with many of the top names in the music industry before finally settling down in Seattle. Bobby has built a successful career as a player, composer, and booking agent, and most recently has teamed with Paul Barron to put his experience and musical passions to work, helping players, young and old, reach a higher level. So, pour yourself a big glass, pull up a chair, and let the hang begin! Uh, and here we are back again for another tantalizing, titillating, uh, whatever kind of um, <laughs> hang. And I am joined uh, this time uh, by Mr. Bobby Medina. Bobby, it is a pleasure to finally get a chance to connect. We've been asked at this for a little bit, but uh, it's good to finally have you on the show. Thank you so much. I I've been looking forward to it. This is great. Oh, man. You know, it's... Um, it's really fun to be able to, uh, you know, you, social media has been great in some ways. It's been just a complete catastrophe in other ways, but we won't get into that. <laughs> but it's nice to be able to connect with people, you know, make friends uh, all over the world. Um, and then, you know, there's something special about that when you can take that relationship to the next level. So for us being able, you know, we're not in the same room, but at least kind of face to face to talk to each other and get to know each other. Um, you know, that, that's a real joy for me. And because you've been doing so much on the social media front, uh, you know, your, your involvement with, uh, you know, with Paul Barron and, you know, some of the projects you guys have had going on a lot of the, the posting and stuff, you know, you, you're just really doing a great job of, uh, keeping the trumpet community connected. So, I mean, what's kind of inspired you to, to be so active and involved in the community in this way? Well, COVID, <laughs> COVID started a lot of this as, as it may, may have had an effect on you like that. But uh, I had a lot of time on my hands. You know, I'm I'm pretty much just a professional trumpet player. It's mostly what I do. I I don't teach a whole lot anymore. At one time years ago, I had tons of students and all that. But I over the years, I've developed uh, an agency and I've developed a career as a solo artist and what whatnot. And so it's kept me really busy. So when COVID hit, I had a lot of time on my hands. And unlike a lot of people, I didn't have students and stuff. <clears throat> so I was just um, messing around one day looking at a few few groups and this and that. And uh, my son, I have two kids, I have a daughter and a son. And, and, and my son, when he was younger, used to play uh, football, so soccer. And so he loved it. And he always would say, Dad, you should play in a men's league, like, you know, 40 and above or, you know, in, in different age categories. And I started thinking about it. And I said, you know, there's no kind of, I mean, music is an art. It's not a sport. And I'll say that first. But, you know, I thought, you know, there's as, as we get older, you know, I'm, I'm no spring chicken anymore. And uh, things happen. We have a lot of a lot of positive things that happen in our playing um, because we've learned from experience and uh, hopefully figured out a few things. And and then we have uh, other issues uh, like I've had friends that have had some serious health problems. I lost some friends to COVID. I mean, I've had the whole gamut. And as you get older, people start to get a little bit more in poor health, I guess we'll say. And so I just 
thought one day, I wonder what would happen if I just started a group that was for trumpet players that were 50 and above. And I put this thing out there and this thing just took off like wildfire. And uh, everybody, you know, felt, I guess I wanted to create a place where people didn't feel like they were a bunch of old farts, you know, hanging around and would be, uh, I don't know, maybe be rated by <laughs> younger guys or I don't know. I just thought I would do it for fun just to see who had something in common and uh, how it would go. And lo and behold, it has taken off and uh, it's been very fun. Yeah. Well, you know, it's to me, obviously being, being 50 plus um 60 plus at this point um that that it you you're absolutely spot on that there are things that you learn through wisdom through age and experience um but then there there's this this whole plethora of things that 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 start to occur as you get older and you can no longer approach for better or worse, you can no longer approach your playing the same way that you did when you were, you know, 20, 30, even 40. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, it it what's what's great to me is uh, you know, and especially that from a marketing perspective, from a business perspective, you know, you're you're told to always, you know, try to identify like the pain points of your potential customer that you're, you know, you're trying to solve a problem for them. And that's one of the pain points is that, you know, for those of us who are a little bit older, that are dealing with things like uh, you know the, the way that your teeth change over over the years, the way your your uh, muscle elasticity, your the collagen levels in your body change, you know, surgery, your air capacity, yeah, all these surgeries changing, and there are very few people who publicly talk about these things, and to to have that kind of uh, environment where not only is it talked about, but there's some some really good information that's coming out. So like, like for yourself, like what are some of the, the biggest things that you've seen change uh, over your career, the way you had to approach the horn, the way you had to approach music as a result of your age? And, you know, how have you been able to uh, make adjustments so that, that you're able to still perform at a high level? Well, it's, it's ever, it's ever evolving. I guess that's, that's one thing. And I don't have, I don't stick to any particular dogma about teaching. I mean, there are people that are out there that are like my first, what I will say, great teacher was Jimmy, Jimmy Stamp. And there's a lot of people that uh, believe that Jimmy Stamp is the way or Carmine Caruso is the way I studied with Carmine or Claude Gordon. And, and I, I believe all of these teachers have great things to offer. Part of the part of the issue that happens is people get locked into that one philosophy and it, it doesn't, it doesn't always work for everybody. You know, they all have their star students, but there's other people that it just doesn't work for. So I, I realized a long time ago through my, through my personal mentorship for over 40 years uh, with Bobby Shue. And he used to tell me that you have to figure out your own way to do this. And it really, really is true. So, I mean, I've I've had uh, you know some minor surgeries. I've had um, I feel like my air capacity is not the same that it used to be. I'm not a really big guy, so I never had a ton of uh, air. Uh, I I I feel like I'm I'm trying to stay just physically fit and strong. I kind of watch what I eat uh, and I exercise every day, uh, for the most part. Uh, I feel like my efficiency is better. I feel like I need to really focus on getting the machine working. And for me, what it has really, really boiled down to is really understanding how to get my whole body involved in playing and not just not just this, you know, and I think uh, I think too many people just just only focus on this and I'm going to play this routine and it's, you know, I'm going to get better and stronger and and it it works a little bit, but it in the long run, it doesn't it doesn't always work. And I would say it probably doesn't always work for most people. Yeah, it's yeah, it's, it, it's so funny because there's so many, you know, it, certainly there's a level of simplicity, you know, you, you can, you can boil it down to a very simplistic thing, you know, put the mouthpiece to your, your mouth and put air through and there you go. That's how you play the trumpet. But 
there's also a level of complexity because of the the nature of the holistic system that is us. So you have so many different, uh, I mean, the obvious physical things like, you know, how's the strength of your embouchure? How is your air support? So yeah, we got those things, but then we also have other things that tie into that. So, you know, how, you know, your posture affects the, your ability to breathe and to play efficiently. Your, your mental state definitely uh, does that. And as we get a little older and, you know, when you're, when you're in high school, yeah, you, you got nothing to worry about, really. You have no aches and pains at the, in those years, right? <laughs> you get the pains and, you know, you're, you're also thinking about, you know, as you get a little older, you're thinking about the mortgage or you're thinking about how am I going to retire or what am I going to do? You know, so you've got all these different things that are, that are, that can get into your head that prevent your music from getting out of your heart and out of the horn. So, um, you know, I, I I really like what you you know you said. You know, and I I love Bobby as well. That you know you have to figure out how to do this you know for yourself. But the only way to do that is yeah. I mean, you can certainly you know do trial and error all the time. But when you're around all these different people and you can try to glean information from people and you know try, try a little what Jimmy said, try a little bit of what Carmine said, try a little bit of what Roy Stevens said, and just find what works for you and put it together in your own unique mix. So, you know, when you're, when you're thinking about, you know, it, your progression over the, the past, let's say the past 20 years, uh, what are some of the key areas where you felt like, okay, um, this is, this is an area that I, I really have to not only rethink, but maybe reinvent uh, if I want to maintain my, uh, my control over, over my abilities? Hmm. I, I would say that there are a couple of things that have affected me probably the most. And one of them is truly understanding. Well, the first one is being aware, because a lot of people pick up their instrument. I'm going to play my routine. I got an hour to practice or two hours or whatever I want to do. Bop, 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 bop. And they pick it up and they do the same old thing day in and day out without much results, you know, and they, they wind up staying at a kind of at a plat, we'll call it a plateau, they plateau, and they never bump up to another level. And they wonder why they get stuck there. And there are a number, in my opinion, I'm going to preface that everything I say, it's related to me, it may not be exactly you. Um, but in general, I've had to become aware of how my body works and not just how my body works, but sometimes, and, and I think this is a huge, huge key point, um, a, lot of, a lot of just extremely great players that I've run across, my opinion again, they have a hard time explaining what they do because they may be more of a natural at it, you know, and they, they often think they're doing one thing, but the reality is, they're they're not they're not actually doing that and so i've been taught like all these different ways of breathing and all these different techniques and until you figure out really how how your body works and finding out if you're actually doing it right through experimentation through visual aids through different kinds of things uh it's 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 hard to get better you know, so breathing, things like that, understanding my body, understanding tension, uh, tension plays havoc in a lot of people's playing. And it's like there's tension right here. People play with a lot of tension in the center of their embouchure and they wonder why they can't play any higher. They play with a lot of tension in different parts of their body. And tension is sympathetic. Our whole system is held together through muscles and nerves and uh, sheathing over the muscles and all that. So one area affects a lot of others. And if we have tension or fears or worries here, it also trans, you know, translates into the rest of your body. So I've had to kind of figure that out for me, uh, both, both mechanically and, uh, and mentally. And I've had to experiment and I've had to get off a lot of roads that I thought were kind of like biblical in nature, you know, like uh, stamps thing for me, quick, quick story. I went to stamp. I, I saw started seeing him when I was uh, in the 11th grade. Maybe it was a 12th grade. Uh, I was still in high school and I had two friends that had graduated. They were studying with him 
uh, off in college and and I kept bugging him, get me a lesson with him, get me a lesson with him, you know, and finally he agreed to give me one lesson and he and uh, kind of sized me up. And uh, in this lesson, he told me, he said, first of all, I never see like high school kids. I, I only see people that are really serious. I'm going to give you one lesson and then you're going to have a month to practice and then you're going to come back. And if I, you know, if you're not like on top of it, then I just, I don't have time for that kind of thing, but, but in a very nice way, because he was just a super nice man. And, and I went into the first lesson, I had had braces, I had the world's airiest sound, most uncloudy, unfocused sound ever. And uh, I went into my first lesson, which was at Cal State Fullerton, my old alma mater down in Southern California. And um, Jimmy just asked me to play a couple notes. So I played a couple of long tones and he heard what was going on. And he sat at the piano and he played a low C and he buzzed a low C on his lip. And I, I had never seen anybody do that. And I have a, I had a drum corps background and a marching band and all, jazz band, all those backgrounds. But I had never really studied with anybody that was super, super serious, I guess, about the trumpet at that point. And uh, I just found that fascinating. Then he played his, started to play his little um, scale pattern. And I, I was just kind of blown away. So he asked me if I could play, if I could buzz a pitch. And I had a hard time just getting low C out. Then I got low C and he wanted me to do the scale pattern. I could not do the scale pattern. So he just had me go from C to C sharp, then C to C sharp and back down. And then it started coming in. Then he had me take out the mouthpiece. He had me buzz, buzz the scale pattern. And honestly, within, I always say eight minutes because that seemed to be the average. I could go from being my worst chop day ever to my greatest feeling chops in just a matter of minutes with him because he knew exactly what to do. So within a few minutes on my first lesson, my tone cleared up. And I mean, it was so vibrant and something I had never experienced. And I have never had that cloudy, fuzzy tone, although I wish I could get it sometimes, you know, I, I like that chat sound. I mean, I can, I can kind of get it at times if I, if I really need to, but, um, but he was a master at that and, and, you know, teaching you how to, how to get the machine going in in his way he had a lot of tricks and a lot of great ideas yeah well you know that with learning with, in, with anything any skill uh there's always um everybody's got their own perspective on it and yeah you know, like like you know we've been saying talking about that uh it's a matter of of where you're at personally physically emotionally mentally uh, all those those things come into play um and it's so easy to get caught up in the dogma. Uh, and sometimes I guess even the, the teacher starts to buy into their own PR. Uh, yeah. And and it, it should be about uh, developing a, a, as broad of a vocabulary as possible to explain things um, with the hopes that it resonates with, with that person. That That is hitting the nail right on the head. Um, um, you know, Paul and I do this. We have developed a, a body a body mechanics program here for trumpet players. And we've spent a lot, a lot of time going through things and figuring things out. But one of the things we've figured out uh, is there are many different ways of saying the same thing. And this is part of, I think, the dogma that exists from, you know, uh, Whatever method it might be, whatever school of thought it might be, I think they're all they're all similar. They're all paths leading to the same place. We can say, you know. Um, however, sometimes just a word. Uh, even at one point, you know, uh, before Shu had this really together in his breathing and uh, his wedge technique, we'll say, I remember him telling me to bear down on it, and I thought, hmm. What does bear down on it actually mean? You know, am I pushing out? Am I pushing up, down, back, sideways? You know, and it was cloudy for me, you know, and and it and and even to this day, if I think about those words, it causes a lot of tension in my playing. 
you know, whereas if you say something else, it, it may free, free things up for you. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's why, I mean, it, it, there's certainly a dichotomy that exists. Uh, having access to more information uh, in theory should provide you with uh, a clearer picture of, of the possibilities of where any given uh, potential problem uh, to find a solution. You, you, the, the more information you have, then the more you should be able to glean from that and, and to piece things together. However, the problem is, is that uh, not all information is created equal. So there's, there's just as much bad advice out there as there, there is good advice. Yeah, probably and, more, more yeah. bad advice than good advice, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. So it's how do you put everything together in a way that uh, A, makes sense, um, and two, is beneficial, um, and particularly beneficial in the long run. And to me, that's where the importance of having a, a mentor, a teacher, a coach, whatever you want to call it, that's where I think that that becomes very critical. So, yeah, you mentioned Bobby as being, uh, you know, a, a longtime mentor and obviously uh, Jimmy Stamp, a you know, great impact on you. Were there any other people that that really kind of helped you to codify the way that you approach uh, the horn? Well, many, many years ago, I, I worked on a cruise ship and we'd stop, uh, we'd have, we'd have dry dock or whatever on the East coast. And if we had some time off, I would go to New York and I'd go take a lesson from Carmine Caruso. And, uh, that, that kind of, that was very interesting for me. I mean, that approach, cause he wasn't even a trumpet player. And, uh, and at the time I have to say that it didn't, it didn't work for me at all. You know, um, I had studied with people that that had studied with Claude Gordon, you know, and uh, it worked to a degree for me. But my for me, it was always my my upper register that was really lacking. And uh, I think through hanging out with a lot of people and eventually coming to the coming to grips with nobody's going to be able to tell me how to do this. I have to become my own best teacher. And so I started doing a lot of um, reading a lot, uh, learning a lot about teaching, learning a lot about how the mind works, how the body works, um, things of that nature. And, and ex personal observation and experimentation. And so that was the beginning, really, that was what was the most helpful to me. But there's another thing that I think is really, well, a couple other things that I think are really, really helpful. And you sort of touched on it. You were talking about, you know, you know, where people want to head. So people need to know what they want to improve. You can't just say it. I don't just say, I just want to get better playing trumpet. You know, I, I, I think I posted up a question, you know, a while back in, in our group, uh, asking what are people's goals and it was interesting because there were a number of people that just said i, I want to get better i want to play the trumpet better but that's almost like saying i want to make more money this year or i want to get more gigs this year or whatever that doesn't really pinpoint where you want to head you know do you want to do you want to focus on technique sound repertoire range whatever you know and so i think when you when you practice, when you go into, uh, when you have that time, it should really be sacred time. It shouldn't be in front of a phone or, you know, a computer messing around. You have this time for you. And as we get older, as you know, it seems like we have less and less time to, to be able to give away or to maybe for ourselves to practice or whatever. So that's that's one thing is to figure out exactly what you want to improve. And then the other thing is to is the art of focus. I think computers, social media, just a, a faster life pace in general, information overload uh, has people in a mindset where they can't focus. And and I even get into that myself. You know, we got a lot of things going on sometimes. So you have to learn to slow down, to center yourself. And uh, contrary to what people believe about our minds being able to, what do we call that when we're able to multitask, right? So we don't really multitask. You know, what happens is your brain goes here, 
for a moment and it focuses and it goes there and it focuses and it's, and you're never doing one thing. And so I think when you really want to improve your playing, you have to focus on one goal. And then you have, at least for me, this has been the most helpful. I focus on one thing at a time. That thing might be just the initial release of the note. You know, was it clear? Was it full? Was it centered? Was it vibrant? You know, and I may do that. Some days it takes me, you know, two or three and I got it. Other times it takes an, an hour, you know, uh, depending on how hard I played the, the night before or whatever. But to focus on one thing at a time is really powerful, whether that's air, your inhalation, your posture, whatever. But, you know, I think that's been super helpful for me. And I think it would be helpful. I, I know it's helpful to other people because I've taught it and there's been a lot of uh, positive feedback about it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. You know, the, the way the brain functions, uh, multitasking is, is not a possibility, uh, un unless, and the only way you can do that is when you, when you start to stack things and that's, and that's what we do. That's, you know, all, oh, if you take any action, you know, like tying your shoe, it's, it's a variety of actions that have to occur, but now it's become chunked. Uh, mm -hmm. and so and then it just becomes a singular action. So, you know, I, I, for, for me, one of the things that I've been working on is to take, to take a thematic approach to practice, like saying, okay, well, I really need to work on my, my initial, you know, release of the note, as you were saying. So I may do some flexibilities. I may do some etudes. I may work on some charts that I got to play for an upcoming gig, but everything that I do is filtered through how is that initial attack or how is the vibrancy of the tone? So I'm able to, to do a lot of stuff, but it's not like this is this practice. This is this practice. It's all one practice, but it's all one practice through a singular filter and a singular focus. Mm -hmm. So that's just, that's yeah. So that's in essence, that's your goal, you right. know? And, and, and I think, like I just said, I, I think a lot of people don't go into a practice room, you know, I, you know, and, see the big picture, you know, the, you know, and, and, and really think about what it is I want to, you know, I always ask myself, what do I want to accomplish in this next hour, this next 30 minutes or whatever, you know, and, and that varies every time I pick up the horn, sometimes it's, it's damage control, you know, and just get my chops going again. And other times it's like, wow, I got some time set aside to really, and I haven't played hard for a while, so I can really let it rip and I'm going to work on some really strenuous stuff, for instance, you know, or I might just be focusing on, uh, hey, I'm going to play some repertoire uh, and that, but, but maybe my, my focus is I'm going to play with this light of pressure as possible, you know, during this session. And eventually when you start to really understand all that stuff, then it does start to chunk together and form into a particular habit, whether, whether that's good or bad. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it's, um, ha yeah, habits are, are, are interesting and they're, they're a are way of, of uh, minimizing energy expenditure, you know, so everything's kind of, it, it, it happens on its own without having to, to go through like decision fatigue, what am I going to do? How am I going to do it? That sort of stuff. But one of the things that, you know, as you're talking about, like, you know, being focused on playing, I think that, that one thing sometimes people do lose sight of is that uh, it's okay to just sit and noodle. It's okay to do that. If that's your objective, you know, if you just want to, Hey, I want to sit down and just, just blow for 20 minutes just to, just to do it, just to relieve a little stress and 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 get my mind off of things. That's great, but don't expect that to be your uh, your gateway to your double high C or to <laughs> tightening up your triple tonguing. You know, it's it's like you were saying. You know, having that very clear objective and whatever your objective is is your objective. You know, I, I it's not up to me to say what's right or wrong. If that's what you want, go for it. You know, uh, exactly. Well, I think it's good to get your mind off of. Uh, some of the technical sometimes as well. And I think it's fun because I'm kind of a guy that, I, you know, my my background is, is primarily commercial playing, jazz playing, Latin playing. So 
I often just play melodies or I'm, I work in, uh, no, I noodle around in alternate keys that I don't always get a chance to play in and that I don't always have as much facility in. And uh, I find that it opens up my ears for harmony. It, it starts to connect my mind with my horn. It does it, does it help uh, playing in the upper register? Not, not really, but, but it does help other elements. And, and it really, it's one of the things that for me really connects my my mind horn connection as well, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's it. That, and that's really important. I mean, and, and I think also, uh, you know, when we go back to why we play, um, we play because we love it. We, we, we play because, yeah, it's, there was some point in our life where we said, this is what we want to do. Not because of the, the guaranteed billions of dollars that you're going to make as a uh, as a trumpet player uh but we we decide to pursue this whether it's at the highest level of professional level or whether it's just being an amateur player and just you know playing community bands and things like that we do it because we love it and i think that's sometimes we get so caught up in the the progress uh and not not so much the progress of in terms of our own personal progress but in the progress that we we base on our comparison to others it's like you know well i can't i can't play as fast as bobby or i can't play as you know it's good jazz or i can't play the high notes or whatever you know instead of thinking about i just want to get a little bit better every day i want to improve this set of skills uh and it stops being fun because it becomes this uh really uh it becomes torture almost um so i mean how do how do you keep the fun in your practice? Well, first of all, I'm very fortunate because since I was a young a young guy, my dad had always uh, encouraged me. He had always said, don't compare yourself to others and don't worry about what people say about you or whatever. Let it roll off you, you know? And it's always just kind of been one of those things that I did. And, um, it's just it's interesting how how things how things go how they work. Um, I'm trying to think of where you were headed with that. Remind me on that. Uh, just uh, you know how how do you how do you keep the joy in? Oh yeah, well I mean for me a big part of it I, the trumpet has just at this point in my life it's just a habit and it's something I like I feel like I need to do it's like I love doing it you know and uh, part of it is just the joy of of doing it for the sake of doing it uh, I see noticeable improvement uh, you know I have we all have these days that are really great and then we have other days that are not so great and then on the days that are not so great figuring out, oh, well, you're doing a little bit of this or you're doing a little bit of that. You better check this out. And then being able to repair it and sort of get off. I'm kind of off of the, what what Paul and I like to call the um, roller coaster of inconsistency. I've developed uh, to a point where I know how to not fall off the track very often. And then when I'm off the track, I know how to get right back onto it. Um, and, and granted, like anybody, there are, there are times when it does take a little longer to get back on track if, if you've played really hard or you haven't, but it's, I think all of that is just fun for me in general. And of course, playing, playing at a high level, playing with making music with other people. Uh, I don't compare myself to other people. I know that there's only you know one Jose Johnson. There's only one Wayne Bergeron or one Louis Dowdswell or one Maurice Andre or wh whoever some of your uh, you know favorite superstars may be. That's their path. That's not your path. You know, and and it's nice. I think it's nice to aspire and be inspired by people like that. But um, you know, I think it would be. <laughs> be great to play you know g above double high c anytime i wanted to and, and do certain things but it's ultimately not what i get called for and um i i'll give you a quick little sample we did a new year's gig and i did a a uh 
a really nice, it was a VIP special dinner event for uh, VIPs of a casino, of a really kind of nice casino. And uh, the room was totally decked out. They had a beautiful sound system for us. And I did it with just a, a quintet, trumpet, tenor, keys, bass, and drums. And they just kind of wanted, they said, you do whatever you want, jazz, or, you know, just kind of keep, you know, have a fun, but kind of light, mellow vibe. And uh, I noticed that, and I've never, not that I don't usually have, this doesn't usually happen in a public type of event where people, where you're there as background music and not as the show. But we were, I played a, a number of ballads. And I had my, in this case, I had my Ulvain um, Harmon mute, which I loved, and they had a great mic on me. And uh, I'd play something, you know, um, whatever whatever ballad it was, but just a real intimate, low-key, quiet, breathy, lot of space, and just made music. We were really listening to each other. And it was one of those days when the band just gelled and it felt great. Great, you know, but boy, people at the end of some of these songs, you could hear a pin drop, you know, and then they would clap and the staff was clapping and stuff. It was it was interesting. But uh, my point is, is that you can really capture people with sound and with sort of an intimacy in the music. And that's kind of what I do. Other people capture it with excitement and, uh, you know, high playing and exciting playing. And that's another way to do it. But that's not always how I, I can do a little bit of, a, of that, but that's not really what I normally do. Yeah. Well, I, I think that that is really an important point because um, yeah, I, I say this a lot, that music is a form of communication. And, you know, we don't all speak the same way. We don't all uh, feel the same way. Uh, like, you know, some people are extroverts, some people are introverts and, and, you know, your your personality needs to be able to come through in your music and to make it your music, not just you playing somebody's chart, but you actually playing music and making music. So, uh, you know, having that clarity, um, I think it's, that's that's so important, you know, because most of us go through lives like uh, kind of chasing, you know, the shiny object where we're kind of like the, you know, the squirrel kind of uh, mentality and not just really settling down and saying, no, this is who I am. And while all these other things are, you know, are nice and they're great, but you know, this is my lane and this is, this is where I can, I can make the most impact. So, um, you know, how, how did you come about that? I mean, was this, was that always the way that you, um, you felt the music or, or was it just, uh, you know, something that, that developed over time? Well, it's a constant evolvement, I think. And of course, when I first started playing, I mean, I'll 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 back up and I'll I'll say that um, <laughs> I like to say that I come from the most northernmost city in Mexico, which is called East Los Angeles, California. And uh, I grew up. My mother was from Mexico. My father's from the states, and my first instrument was an accordion. And so I learned, uh, you know, harmony and theory and all this stuff. And uh, I found that the accordion was not physically a challenge. I got to be kind of really super technical on this thing. Uh, And then I switched in like junior high school. I, I got an old coronet and I picked that up and it was really challenging to play, you know? So it took me in another direction. Um, and it it, it kind of has gone from there. So when I started playing trumpet, cornet, all that stuff, of course, I just wanted to get a sound and play like the rest, be in the band and hang in there with everybody else. But later on, uh, through my folks, my dad uh, being American, he had Harry James records and Jonah Jones records and all these great recordings, Ellington, Basie, and my mom from Mexico. We had mariachi music. We had uh, more tropical kind of music playing. And her mother, when uh, when she had been young, she had been an opera singer in Mexico. 
And so I had all this symphonic stuff that I listened to. And as, as I progressed, you know, I got into Doc, Doc Severinsen and Al Hurt back in the day. They were the kings when I was like in high school in that. And uh, of course, other people, uh, Clark Terry, one of my favorites, and Chet Baker, uh, Maynard, you know, all these different players. And I think for me, you kind of are kind of, you absorb a little bit of this stuff from all of your favorite players and without trying to be them, you can, you can find your own way and you can start to create your own sound. And that, that for me is how I've kind of evolved, but also as a keyboardist, uh, you know, I kind of, I think I kind of play in a little bit of a different way because I think maybe slightly different from just somebody that only plays trumpet. Yeah. Yeah. And makes a big difference. So, uh, I mean, you, you obviously said, you know, you, you, you played uh, piano or accordion, play keyboards, playing trumpet. And, and you mentioned earlier that you uh, started an agency. So uh, you, you do composition, you do arranging, you do, uh, uh, do you do booking and things like that? Yeah. Uh, well, with my age, with regard to my agency, the whole thing started uh, many years ago down in Southern California, working with a guy uh, who was British, but he was of Indian descent. And he was this really handsome guy and he was older than me and he was doing shows. And uh, I was just like a trumpet player for him at one point. And then he realized I could play piano keys. And then he realized I could play key bass. Uh, and so this thing kind of led me on a path with him in uh, which he would start to send me out with my own little group, terrified as I was back then. And then he sort of started to teach me the, the business end of playing and getting gigs and this and that. So um, we, had, we had a couple of good years together. And then there had been a little bit of a, not really a falling out, but kind of a disagreement about certain things. And, uh, and so I went my way, he went his way, and I went out on ships and went out on tours, Ray Charles and all these other people. And then I came back to Southern California for a minute, and I decided uh, uh, I wanted to move up, up, up this way. And so I, up by up this way, I mean, I live now in the Seattle, Seattle Northwest area here. So... Uh, so I, I basically took these, this knowledge of what I had and um, started booking, started a band up here, started writing charts, putting a, a thing together. And then uh, one year we had done a Christmas party for somebody for a couple of years. And the following year, they tried to book us like in November and I was already booked. And they said, well, do you have anybody else that you can send? And Bing, this little light went off. I said, oh, yeah, you know, I got a bunch of friends. So I started putting other bands together. And and one thing just led to another. And, uh, you know, I mean, it, it's, was, it has been a lot of work. And we've done everything from just really super small, quiet, little background events to huge corporate events to bringing out some, you know, some big name acts and building stages and doing sound and lighting and uh, organizing of the events and managing of them. And so, uh, yeah, that's, that's how that went, but it, but it, it keeps me going. It keeps me busy. And it's, it's, it's another way my brain uh, uh, kind of gravitates towards, I guess I'll say another way my brain tends to work. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I work with a, uh, an events band and uh, part of an, an entertainment company uh, here in, in PA. And um, it's been real interesting because I've gotten to be friends uh, with really good friends with the, with the owners who actually are in the band that I'm in as well, but they have a number of bands that they book and also, you know, sub out some stuff and learning more about that side of the business has been very eye opening to me. And makes me more appreciative. You know, I don't have to go out and book, but then I understand what they're going through trying to book gigs. So, you know, it makes me a little feel a little bit more responsible for holding up my end of the deal. 
Uh, and, and I kind of have a feeling it's like, wow, that's really something that I feel like anyone who wants to be a professional musician, um, they should at least intern with some sort of uh, of entertainment company agency, uh, you know, contractor or something. Understand the backside of the business because that's going to give you a, a different appreciation for what you do. So, uh, you know, what what are some of the areas that that you think like as as someone who does that kind of work, where yeah, you, know, you kind of wish people maybe had a little bit more insight into or, or appreciation of. Well, for instance, here uh, I have a son who who went off to music school, and he went off to we put him in a in a music production course, and now he's off in in Colorado doing his thing, and he still comes out uh, from time to time, and and we do certain shows together, certain gigs that I have out here. And I've told him a lot of things over the years, and I'm amazed with how much he's actually absorbed because he'll throw all this stuff right back at me, you know? But I mean, there's some things are just so simple and yet musicians can be so dense, you know? Uh, And much to the detriment of their, their career or being called back. I mean, I always tell my son, you know, you got to be early. I mean, it's a huge deal. It might not be a huge deal to you. And you might think I got plenty of time and it only takes me a couple of minutes to set up my, my stuff and I'm ready to go. But, you know, really you're like, for me, I mean, let me point something out. Me as the, say the band leader or the contractor uh, of the, of the group. It's like, if I tell somebody, we'll say, they'll say, what time are you going to be here? And I'll say, well, we don't start till six, but I'll I'll be there at three o'clock, you know, roughly to start the sound check or load in and all that stuff. And I often, if I'm there like one minute after three, I got a phone call. Where are you at? I thought you were going to be here at three by a client that's paranoid. We're not going to show up, you know, so I'm always early. And I expect those that are playing, working with me to be early you know, and to not be packing up on the last song. You know, I've had people packing up their clarinet or my double, there's my flute, I'm not going to use this, you know, and then the, the last one's in and the first one's out. So it's, you know, it's a little bit extra time, but if there's any issues, if there's traffic, if there's, you know, just a vibe to come in and if you need to meet new people, you have a chance to, you know, get to know them and say hi and figure things out. You know, there's always... It seems like there's always some kind of little last minute issues that happen. And when you have a little bit of extra time, um, those things can be managed, you know, and then just the sheer amount of work there is behind it. I mean, like you said, people often, they don't have a clue. They may show up to do a two hour show or whatever, maybe a rehearsal and a show and that's it. And that can be, that can be done in a block amount of time of say three or four hours, but I may have, 60 hours into this thing running running around doing meetings zoom calls you know writing charts or organizing charts copying charts collating them numbering and put them into putting them into folders so that this whole this show runs smoothly you know i'm in the middle of uh, putting together a like a hollywood kind of uh, awards type of show for a corporate event coming up and I'm in the throes of all this stuff because we're having to put together, or I'm having to put together, um, you know, thematic music for movies and television shows and stuff to go to play through the whole night. And then I have to create all these walk-on and walk-offs, you know, uh, so the, and that's separate music. And then I have to work with the client to get cue sheets and, you know, what are my cues going to be? So I know when to conduct the band to bring them in. Are we going to use headsets? Are we not going to use it? How is that going to work? So there's a lot of things that people don't, it's not their fault. They just don't realize always what's going on. And as a person like you working in this group, working, getting to know these people, you see all that stuff. And yeah. so I, I often, when I, when I work for other people, I want to be early. I, I want them to know, like, I don't ever have to worry about him. He's always sharp. He's always prepared. I got every mute that I need. I got every horn that I need, you know, and, and I take the time to quickly respond back to them, 
and maybe even touch base even when they haven't touched base with me. I'm pretty good about touching base a number of times with all of our uh, all of the people that I'm working with, you know. So I don't know. Those are I think that's those are a couple of important things, you know, and to be positive. Nobody wants to be around somebody that's a drag on a gig, you know, somebody that's complaining or bad mouthing other people, you know. And uh, I think that's a really important thing. I mean, I hire people. I would rather have, and I saw Maynard say this one in a clinic when I was in high school, and this has stuck with me my entire life. And Maynard was talking about, I think somebody asked a question, how do you choose your guys? And how good do you have to be or something like that? And he said, you know, there are guys that are spectacular, that have so much talent, you know, but... He said, I would, and, and they can be difficult to work with. I would, I will work with somebody that has less talent. That's easy to get along with any day of the week. And I've revised this my own way to say that people can have this much talent, but most gigs only require like in, in this area. Yeah. Once in a while there's that, but most gigs are down here. So I want to work with somebody that's going to be fun that I'm going to, that I'm going to enjoy being around so that I feel up and I'm not tired on the gig and I'm energized by it. And I, I, you know, I, I try to give that back to them as well as our clients as well. Yeah. Well, I think that is really, really important stuff to, to keep in mind for anyone who's looking to be uh, either to start a, a career as a freelance musician or those those of us who, who have been doing this for a while. You know, sometimes it's just a good reminder that, that uh, you know, we can get lazy, we can get grumpy, we can do all those things that come with old age. Um, but let, let's uh, let, let's be civil. Civility is becoming a lost art. <laughs> yeah, it is. And and you actually, like for me, it's like the, the playing of the gig and making of the music is really the fun part. I often tell people, yeah, you're paying me for all the other stuff for organizing and setting up and bringing in blah, 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 and writing charts and all this stuff. But once I get there, the music is free, you know, and, and, and I want it to be, I want to feel happy at that point. So whatever I have going on on the outside you know, I really, really try to shut it off and just go, this is my time right now. And these people have paid us for this and we're going to have a good time and we want them to have a great time. Mm -hmm. And so I think that is hugely important. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that, that I, I fought with for a number of years, and it, it, it's a, a stigma that uh, that's related to being in like an events band, like doing doing these corporate gigs, doing the like you said the the background music sort of stuff, um, that you know th there's there's something that gets into our head that if you're not on Broadway or if you're not in the if you're not you know doing the mo big movies scores at uh, Columbia Records or whatever, yeah, that that if you if you're not doing those things, if you're not playing Carnegie Hall, then you're not successful, uh, and it's it, it's somehow less than. So, you know, for, for you, I mean, how, how have you been able to, to deal with all these things and still come into, regardless of whether you're like, a, I know you went to Buenos Aires to uh, record uh, your, uh, your last CD album, whatever we want to call it these days, MP3s. Uh, so, you know, you, you've done big stages, you've toured with, with major acts and, and you, you do these casuals, you do the smaller gigs. How do you, uh, how do you maintain that level of professionalism and, uh, you know, being being on your game, regardless of the size of the venue? Well, you know, I had always had these hopes of doing big things and I, and I accomplished, you know, certainly I felt like I accomplished a lot of them. And I felt once I had achieved it, it it was it was just sort of a notch on the handle at that point. Not that, it, and it was maybe a great experience, but we were in Italy with I was in Italy with Ray Charles on on a, in this particular tour, and uh, sometimes the band morale would be really low. Back in those days, the management didn't always treat the band in the greatest way. 
scheduling of the tour was harsh at times a lot of bus long bus rides and arriving and you hadn't slept for you know right for a couple of days and you needed to shower all those kinds of things you know and I had this sort of uh I guess it was kind of an epiphany for me and I was looking out into the audience and I just kind of said to myself I said you know these people that are here to watch this amazing Ray Charles you know perform are the same people that go to local clubs and see weddings that their friends' kids are getting married in, or they're at a whatever, they're at a concert at a park or whatever. And it sort of changed my thought process about this whole being in the big time and in the big leagues all the time. I mean, I certainly like to do that, and I certainly still do do some of it. But what happened to me is I... I eventually got married. I had lived in Europe for a while, came back to the States, got married, and uh, then we had kids. And I realized that, you know, when I first got married and moved up to Washington, I still had the opportunity to go out with Ray Charles. I left on a really good terms. And uh, he had said, anytime you want to come back, just let us know. And I always thought, well, I can, I can always do that. But I didn't get married to my wife to leave and, and go on tour. And I have ha- have had people that I know that have done that and their families fall apart. And, uh, and I had been out for basically for like five years, almost straight, doing different road gigs and things like that. So when I had kids, I realized that I really, really need to be around. And I had a great childhood. My parents were both around, supported us in every way possible. And I wanted to do that for my kids. And I was, I was playing, um, I've been playing with the, the four tops and the temptations for like, I don't know how many years, 35 or so years off and on. And um, one time I had them, some of the guys come over my house when we were we were doing some shows out here and my kids were little and I remember the following day my kids saying dad how come you you play with all these famous guys and you do all this big stuff but how come you're not (laughs) famous and I said well I said you like me to go to your soccer games right yeah you like me to go to your gymnastics events right yeah you like me to be there for your school shows right yeah so listen, I I want to be here to sleep in, in my own bed and to be involved with you guys. And so, you know, I choose to just mostly work around here. Once in a while, dad does this or that, or does some recording sessions with some these guys or a quick little tour here or there. But for the most part, I'm around. And for me, I always felt like I could make good music anywhere. You don't make good music just because you're in in a Hollywood studio or on the Ray Charles band or whatever, you can also make great music um, with your own, with your own folks, you know, and do it the way you want to do it. There's a lot of, there's a lot of pluses to it. And again, I think it's not comparing yourself to anybody, but just maybe trying to enjoy and be happy with, with what you, that you're, that you're doing what you want to do. That's how I, that's, that's how I feel about it anyways. Yeah. Yeah, well, and it, it ties in with what we were talking about earlier about, you know, practice and having having clear objectives. And, you know, I think that's where a lot of people uh, get themselves into trouble is that, um, you know, uh, there, Eckhart Tolle, uh, there's, he has a quote about stress that I love. He said, stress is being here and wishing you were there. <laughs> and that's what what happens to a lot of us is that, you know, we... We want to, you know, we think we want to be on the road. We want to be traveling, but then we get bummed out when all of our friends are getting married and having families and having the stability. And it's like, well, you know, it's really hard to have both. And you kind of have to make that decision of what is your priority, make your choice, stick with it and be, you know, don't 
second guess yourself or don't be down on yourself because you're not doing what other people think you should do. As long as you're doing what's important to you, then that at the end of the day, that's the most important thing for you. I think so. Do you know, do you know, I'll give you an example of somebody I think that's got that I would never in a million years have thought would, first of all, that I that I would even cross paths with this person, nor would they ever consider doing something like this. But uh, it, it, his name is Steve Rodby, and he was the bass player with Pat Metheny for many, many years on all these amazing albums. He's a phenomenal bass player. And uh, a few years back, he moved up to Seattle. And I get this phone call from him one day, and he says, I, I heard you're the guy to call. He says, uh, I need, uh, my daughter's getting married. And, uh, well, he told me who he was. And I said, you're not the Steve Rodby bass player, are you? He says, yeah, the guy that, played with, that plays with Matheny? Yeah, that's me. I moved up here now. And so I said, wow, you know, so we chatted for a little bit. His daughter was getting married and they wanted a cello player to do some kind of kind of hip, different types of music. And I know the guy. I said, I got the perfect guy for you. So I I organized it and put it together. And so he started talking. He says, yeah, I'm totally new to town. You know, just trying to get the, you know, feel for things around here. And so I started telling him what, what I do. And he says, man, he says, I lived in Chicago for years and I played with this corporate band out there. Man, if you ever need a sub, call me. I, I'll, I'll be glad to come out and, you know, and play Brick House or whatever, you know. And I just thought it was so cool. And so I actually have called him a couple of times. And, and each time, you know, he's like, well, you know, I'm going to be in New York producing an album for blah, blah, blah. or whatever. So, I mean, he's still busy and he's not a, he's not really like kind of in the scene around here but he's busy outside but just just the attitude that he's open to that um i thought was pretty cool yeah yeah well it's great man yeah it that's the thing you know if you if you really love making music then make music yeah don't 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 limit yourself so I, I, well i i think about some of my longest term friendships are with musicians that I've known since I was kids, you know, and, uh, and others as adults, but we've been friends for 30, 40 years, you know, so there's a lot of, you know, just beyond the music, you, you have a kind of kinship with other people and we're, we, we're kind of our own breed and as, and as trumpeters, we're really our own breed as, as you know. Oh yeah, yeah, we are a unique breed. That is, there's no doubt about that. I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but you know, it's a thing. All right. Well, I tell you what, Bobby, uh, we've got uh, four standard segments that I like to do every uh, episode, and I want to get going on the first one, and uh, it's our newest one, and this is uh, called "Go Practice." Okay. And uh, Go Practice is brought to us by uh, Brian Davis of Airflow Music. And Brian has got some really great online resources for uh, for practice, some daily things you can do, play along with him. It's, it's, it's I love Brian's stuff. He's a great guy and a great trumpet teacher, and a, you know, and a great player. Yeah, yeah. I, he's good, good dude. So um, with this, uh, I want to ask this question. It's kind of been, been the standard now. Um you know, especially we talked about earlier, as, as you get a little older and you have you know, more responsibilities in life, uh, it's not always uh, easy to carve out big chunks of time to practice. Uh, and so efficiency in practice, I think, is, is a great thing. So if you're thinking about uh, for a busy day for you, uh, what are the things that, that are like your non-negotiables that, that you you cannot go a day without doing? Uh, and then what are the things that become, you know, more of the, the flexible, optional approaches to practice that, that you can incorporate when and if you have the time? Well, you know, years ago, Bobby Shu told me, he said, I went on a, I went on a, uh, I went to learn to sail. And he said it was a six week course. And uh, people get all hung up on always having to be on it, you know, because I had been on a horn, like, I think it was about two and a half years without ever taking a day off. I had this thing in my mind. And he, he'd say, I came back from the six weeks, 
sailing course and I had to play a gig the, like that that evening or whatever. And I went in and I did it. And he said, yeah, I felt it, you know, but I got right back on track and all that. And it kind of opened my mind up. He was really about kind of open your, opening your mind up. So I'm kind of an advocate of taking a day off every now and then, you know, whether that's once a week or every couple of weeks or whatever. Um, I feel like it's healthy to get away from it mentally and even physically. Sometimes you, you, it's nice to get away from it and just do something else. That That's me. So there's no like non-negotiable items, but in, but in general, in general, when I, when I practice, I, the first thing I have to do, you know, for me is I have to get the machine going, you know, and get everything working. And once everything is working for me, then if I'm limited on time, I can, I only need to kind of touch on certain things. You know, I may, you know, touch on a, you know, a couple of high passages. I may touch on a little bit of tonguing stuff. It kind of, it kind of also depends for me on what's coming up. You know, do I have a certain uh, kind of gig coming up that requires X, Y, and Z? So I'll kind of gear my practice towards what's coming up. So, so that's, that's how I, in general, how I approach it. Yeah. Hey, that's, that's very, very solid. Yeah. And, but, but there are other days too, when I will say that I get, I love it. And I have the time, uh, when I'll spend uh, half a day practicing four hours, five hours, you know, when COVID first started, I, we had our group, uh, online and, uh, I saw a lot of people just complaining. There's, there's no gigs. There's nothing to practice for. And I was reacquainting myself with the Arbenz book and the Sans Chacom and this and that that I hadn't really gotten into for a long time. And I thought, wow, man, I, I like playing better than I've, you know, on certain things that I've played in a long time. So uh, that's just my attitude towards it. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it, it's an interesting attitude because, you know, when you say there's nothing to practice for, and I, I, the, when you're practicing for the gig, I think that's kind of the wrong mindset. You know, y yes, you need to practice to get, you know, to if you're preparing yourself to be at your best, but why do we practice? We practice because we, because we want to get better and we enjoy what we're doing. So, yes. You know. Yeah. I, I love it. I really do. You know, unless I'm, unless I'm playing really horrible once in a while, I, I, I will admit that I've wanted to throw it away it, just throw it in the trash can. But uh, those days are, are pretty few and far between now. Well, that's good. All right, let's move on to our next segment. The next segment is uh, called Sound Off. That's brought to us by Barkley Microphones. And uh, it's about your approach to a sound. And uh, I think particularly uh, as, uh, you know, we were talking earlier about uh, the uh, trumpet methods for for those of us who are, are getting a little bit older. Um, what are some of the, the things that, that you suggest to people uh, especially as they're coming along in the, the later years where they're playing about uh, ways to better improve the quality of their sound or to uh, develop the kind of sound that, that's going to be sufficient for the kind of work that they're, that they're going to be doing. When we're young, our bodies are strong naturally and we have our most elasticity in our muscles and we have our largest air capacity and it seems like I saw a chart, I think it was an Arnold Jacobs chart somewhere, where when you're 25, after you're 25, your lungs start to atrophy for the rest of your life. And so one of the things that I think trumpet players have a tough time with is their air capacity and understanding how to regulate it as well. But really, the air capacity thing is huge for me. Uh, I feel like I don't have the... Uh, amount of air that I used to have. So we have to kind of fight it. And so I fight it by doing different uh, breathing exercises. And I will just make a blanket statement to everybody. Um, I, 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 there's, there's yoga breathing exercises, all sorts of breathing exercises. And, I've, and I do a variation of, of a lot of them. But some of my very favorite ones are by this guy, Wim Hof. And you can check them out for free on YouTube. 
uh, W-I-M-H-O-F, I believe is how you spell his name. And, and I do these exercises every morning and every evening, not only for my air capacity, but for cleansing my cells at, you know, at the cellular level and oxygenating things. It has made a huge difference in my life. Um, and it has made a big difference in my playing as well. Cool. Yeah. The Iceman, very familiar with his stuff. So <clears throat> really interesting. Are you doing the the uh, the cold baths and? Well, you know, I do a little bit of that. I'm not. I don't do the ice things. You know, I'm not jumping in a pool of ice and stuff. But I, but I do uh, occasionally. We'll go take take the super cold shower for a while and hang in there. And I'll go out and if I get back like today, it's kind of a cold and rainy day, and 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 I might go out in the elements just with without a jacket on and just kind of be out there and really feel the cold, you know, and, and work out in there for a while. So um, I do a little bit of that. All right. Well, God bless you because <laughs> I don't do the cold. So. I, should, I should be, I should, I should uh, my, my mother's from Mexico as well. So, uh, it, you know, it, there's, there's something in, genetically in me that, that says, no, no, it's, uh, it needs to be warm. I know. I don't, I don't love it. I gotta be honest. I don't, I don't love doing it, but I do, I do feel what it does to you physiologically. And when you start to feel these things happen and you know, it's working it, it, there's a, there's a shift that happens in your thinking and in you, in you physically. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's move on to our next segment. Next segment is called Geared Up. Geared Up is brought to us by Venture Mouthpieces, Venture where technology, design, and craftsmanship intersect. Use the code TrumpetGurus21 to get 10% off your order. And uh, this is obviously about gear. Um, and let's, let's kind of stay stay uh, where we are with uh, with us old cats. Um, I mean, I know for myself, I, I've gone through some some different ways of approaching my gear to become a little bit more efficient as I get, as I've gotten a little older. Um, so what are some of the suggestions that you give to people uh, that are maybe looking to uh, regulate their gear to, to better suit the the needs that, that they have at, at a senior ish age? Mm -hmm. Well, like a lot of people, I started on a seven C and I played very large mouthpieces for years, thinking that I could do it all on a mouthpiece like that. And uh, years later, it became, you need a different kind of sound to play this kind of music. It's not, you know, that you're not getting on, on that mouthpiece, you know. And then I started understanding, and I stayed away from high compression mouthpieces. And, and, and for me, I will also state that um, a couple of things. I mean, I, I have a horn that I love, um, but I for me, it's almost like kind of more, the mouthpiece is almost a little bit, maybe a little more important in that match, that balance between the mouthpiece and the horn is often overlooked. People just often go out and buy a horn, I mean, a mouthpiece, and they, they buy it because, oh, I heard this shallow mouthpiece is the one. And it might not be a good match for your horn if your horn is a large bore or a medium bore or whatever. And so we all have a certain kind of resistance that we need to understand. So in general terms, and I don't love to generalize, but in general terms, I feel like I try to play more efficient, smaller, uh, the smaller mouthpieces that I can still get a good sound on, a sound that I feel that I like. Um, and it's, I think it helps. And I think one of the big complaints that happens about, oh yeah, I got a smaller mouthpiece, but I sound terrible on it, you know? And for a long time, I didn't play smaller gear because I thought I sounded terrible on it. And what I realized many years later is that it takes time to acclimate to this mouthpiece and to your sound will grow on this mouthpiece as well. And, um, I think people oftentimes don't give it enough, maybe give it enough time. You know, it takes, it can take a couple months, you know, to really grow into a mouthpiece and really get used to it and understand it. So I, I advocate playing a little bit smaller, the smallest gear you can play with the right sound for the type of gig or music you're playing. Yeah, there you go. 
it's uh, it's a and, good... and I'm, and I'm going to say this too. I'm sorry. And it, and it, it also goes over to my flugelhorn as well. I have, I have a, a, I have like three different flugel mouthpieces that I play on. I have one that I do most recording and shows on. It's a, it's just, it's, it's, it's super accurate, super in tune. I got a little bit bigger one for solo or general solo work. And then I got the big heavy duty when I want that big, fluffy, super, super dark, cloudy sound. I'll use that. So it's not just about trumpet. You know, it, 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 it carries over into all the, all the different instruments you play. Yeah. How about the accordion? <laughs> Yeah, I play. I play. The older I get, the, I want smaller and smaller, so they're lighter, and my arches aren't collapsing. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get on to our final segment, and our final segment is brought to us by Robinson's Remedy Rapid Relief for your sore and tired chops. It's the Robinson's Remedy Rapid Fire Rounds series of questions that bounces all over the place, and uh, just need your quickest response. So, uh, Bobby, my friend, are you ready? Yeah, I think so. I'll do my best. All right, let's see how we do. All right. First question, who's the biggest influence on your life that is not a trumpet player? My father. All right. What is your favorite book? Autobiography of a Yogi by Parmanhansa Yogananda. All right. What's the worst movie you've ever seen? Ooh. I saw this movie one time called the eraser head. I thought it was terrible. <laughs> so I'll go with that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you weren't a trumpet player, what would you want to be? A filmmaker. Okay. What's your favorite drink? Single malt scotch or a good IPA. Kind of half and half there. Okay. If you're going to go to the single malt, are you a Highland, uh, Speyside. Yeah, I'm more a Highland guy. Like I like Balvini Double Wood as an example. That's a good one. Yeah, Balvini 21 is my favorite. Ooh. Yes. It's a good one. All right. Um, you can have a dinner party. Invite any three living people. Who mm. would you want to have there? Oh my God. That is so hard. Three, any three. Any what say, say any three, three living three living people, boy. Come on, Bobby. Think about this a little bit. Three living people. I guess Doc Severinsen. I'd love to. I'd love to hang with Doc Severinsen. Um. I think it would be, let's see, it would be fun to, I, I would love to to meet with Steven Spielberg. I think, I think he would be cool. And uh, might be fun to pick somebody's brain like Elon Musk, maybe. He's kind of all over the place. That might be interesting. Okay. That, that's a good Good little uh, group there. Now you got three additional chairs at your table. You can invite any three people from history. Hmm. Plato. Um. Gandhi. And Confucius. Ah. Oh, okay. So some deep philosophy going on there. Yeah, we got to add. We got to add to add to that that conversation with the other guys. Exactly. All right. Good deal. Uh, next question: Lacquer, plated, or raw? Depends on the horn and the purpose, but in general, lacquer. Okay. What's your favorite quote? Hmm. Gosh. I'm not sure that I can even remember any great quotes right now. I guess I would just have to quote my father and and have and say that don't worry about what people think about you. Okay. What is your greatest fear? 
I think my greatest fear might be that if something were to you know happen to me that I, I wouldn't be able to take care of my family. All right. Uh, you could be granted one superpower. What would it be? Hmm. One superpower. Boy, this is a tough one, too. I got it. I, my superpower would be to be able to speak any language in the dialect that they spoke it in any part of the world or universe I was dry, I was in. Man. So I could speak it, speak it just like a native. Oh, communication. There you go. Then you find out where the best uh, best food is. <laughs> exactly. All right. Um, what aspect of trumpet playing do you feel is the most overrated? Hmm. I think that the aspect, a lot of people think about strength. And I sometimes think that strength in general just is, is overrated with how it relates to trumpet playing. Okay. Um, and now the converse of that, what aspect do you think is the most underrated? Communication through musicality. All right. Uh, you could go back in time and give your younger self one piece of advice about music, what would it be? Focus on what it is that you really want to do, not on what other people think you should do. Okay. And uh, while you're there, you're going to give your younger self one piece of advice about life. Don't worry so much. Understand that everything in general is temporary, and you uh, you you always you always land on your feet, or you generally land on your feet. Okay. So don't worry. Be happy. That's that's from another Bobby. <laughs> yeah. All right. Final question for you, Bobby. What do you want your legacy to be? All I really want it to be is that I think that I was a good person and that I was a, you know, did everything I could for my family. And that I think part of my purpose in life is it, through, through music is, is to make, help make people happy and uplift their spirits. Mm. That's good. Well, I tell you, my friend, you have uplifted my spirits today. So uh, it has been an absolute pleasure getting to know you. Um, and uh, and I just look forward to being able to connect more uh, frequently and in person, uh, hopefully over a glass of Balvini. That would be that, great. That sounds good. Thank you so much for having me here. I really love the podcast and I feel honored to be amongst all the all the amazing uh, musicians that you have uh, that you've interviewed before. So thank you so much. Oh, it's my pleasure. And thank you for the work you're doing for the trumpet community, especially for uh, for old geezers like me. Uh, it, that's, a, that's a service that I think that was missing. And uh, thank you for filling that. And so yeah, uh, absolutely. They can they can find us at uh, tips for trumpeters 50 and beyond. On Facebook, it's a private group. So if you're, you got to fill fill out the questions and the, I mean, fill out the answers and uh, get approved to be in there. And uh, if uh, you're not old enough to be in that group, we have another group that's really nice, which is called Trumpet Diagnostics, um, as well on uh, Facebook. And we and Paul Barron and I have a, a site that we recently released. Uh, trumpetdiagnostics.com. You can go. There's a, a little bit of free training on there. You can check out and uh, learn, a, maybe learn a couple of things. All right. Awesome. Well, folks, the links are in the show notes. So uh, make sure you go check this stuff out because uh, it's great information from two great guys. So 
don't miss out on it. But uh, thank you very much, though, for spending time with us today uh, on this episode of The Hang. Remember to like, share, and subscribe. And uh, any ideas you have for future guests or topics, uh, please hit me up. Let me know. Uh, I'm here just to, to provide a service for you guys. So uh, once again, thanks again, Bobby, for being with me. Thank you for joining us. And peace and sly grease. We out. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Thanks for hanging with us today. This podcast is all about creating deeper connections through our mutual love of music and the trumpet life. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast and also like and share this episode with a friend. We want to see the hang grow for show. Please support our sponsors and consider becoming a personal supporter of this podcast as well. Remember, for less than the price of a bottle of olive oil a month, you can keep this podcast moving smoothly. The Trumpet Guru's Hang is recorded at the Candy Factory, a co-working space and social club located in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Jose Johnson is the executive producer. Post-production editing is by Mitch Bowers. Our opening theme song was composed and performed by Lexi Signal. And our closing theme music comes courtesy of The Greatest Funeral Ever. Incidental music is by Ethan Swayze and Jose Johnson. Graphic design by Ann Kirby of The Sweet Corps. The Trumpet Guru's Hang podcast is produced in collaboration with the So Good Lancaster Media Group. Mm-hmm.